Okay, my next guest is a crowd favorite, multiple time best-selling author, Nomi Prinz. Always an absolute pleasure to speak to Nomi. Here's Nomi Prinz, enjoy. All right, here I am with Dr. Nomi Prinz. Nomi, it's fantastic to see you again. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you so much, Jade. It's always incredible to talk to you. All right, so let's jump in here. My first question for you is quite high level, sort of big picture. Uh, I want you to imagine the world in 2030, all right? So 2020s are wrapped up, the chaos, all the unpredicted volatilities behind us, we're back to some semblance of normalcy or not, but how do you imagine the world has changed thus far? What is the same and what has changed massively? And you can take that any direction you want uh, through the currencies, markets, however you see it. Uh, that is just a fantastic question because there are so many just sectors of not just the market, but of just innovation, of research, of of, of humanity, of commodities, of sort of everything that that is in in real flux right now. Um, and uh, one of the things that we know is that on the one side, there's sort of the money fabrication of of the Fed. There's been inflation. The Fed's come in and raised rates. It's kind of reduced, reduced the size of its book a bit. So it's tightened the kind of value of money right now, but it's also increased the size of its book in response to the mm-hmm. most recent uh, sort of banking crisis with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and so forth. So, so what will be the same, I believe, um, is is really the Fed sort of uh, continuing to have money available to the markets. What I think will be different on the money, and then I'll get to the real stuff um, with re- regard to sort of sectors and assets and just where I see that part of the world going, um, is that I think we'll we'll, we'll be at a, a digital dollar. Um, there will be a central bank um, digital currency by that time. Um, it's likely not all, but many of our bank accounts could be connected um, to some kind of a digital currency because currently there's a lot of um, testing going on with respect to the entire banking system, um, not just in the U.S., but but globally in different aspects. So I think um, the physicality of money is going to change tremendously. On the flip side of that, my segue into real assets mm-hmm. Um there's a number of things that I think will benefit as as a result of that that physicality changing. On the one hand, um, and we're seeing that kind of just in motion now. So so picture what happens in seven years: um, gold and silver, and basically currencies um, that are that are actually also real hard assets um, have been rallying most recently. But but really, since the Fed started pivoting to easing back before COVID, um, and then kind of dipped a bit and came back with this recent um, banking crisis. Um, um, is that I, I see the level of gold, for example, going well over the you know so two thousand level that it's at now. I see it at three, four, even five thousand because there is currently um, this 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 pivot um, to demand back back and forward um, to having real assets, and it's not just from central banks um, which have been stockpiling, um, for example, gold along the way. And there's been a lot of discussion about that. I think that will continue. And particularly the emerging market banks, not just sort of the bigger banks, but the smaller um, emerging market countries are going to be um, also stockpiling more and more gold. But remember, gold is only about 17% used by central banks. In other words, of the available amount of gold that that exists in this world from the sort of inception of mining, um, only about 17% of it is in the hands of central banks, which means that there's potential uh, for that percentage to go higher and that sort of volume to go higher, even though that's the thing we talk about. But also there is the potential for more retail um, to be getting involved in in that kind of a, a sort of hard historical currency um, as a diversification to what's happening with digital currencies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I do see that happening. And also there's, of course, use values uh, for gold in, in the EV revolution, which we don't really see or talk about as much because we talk about other things like silver, which has great conductivity for electricity, copper, which I think also will see incredible demand um, over these, these, these next seven years, also great conductor for electricity and upgrading and updating grids around the world. Um, gold also has some of those conductivity values. And so there's another use value we don't even talk about for gold that will, I think, also come more and more into play as we see um, sort of elect- electrification and sort of decarbonization of the world really take hold, not just sort of in, in theory, um, but actually taking hold. That doesn't mean I think that we get to net neutral, uh, net neutrality, net, um, net carbon neutral. Um, mm-hmm. 
in by that time. Um, I, I think that's a goal. A 2040 is also a goal. It depends, you know, sort of what we're looking at. I don't think we get there, but I think we get a lot closer and, and it's more accepted as just the reality of energy transformation um, as we get closer to 2030. I think we are still really in the very, very beginning stages um, of that revolution, despite the fact that we think we've heard about it um, for, for now several years, or certainly, um, you know, since uh, countries throughout the world have adopted um, this, this concept of 2030 or 2040 um, in terms of going to different levels of, of carbon neutrality. So I think we'll be close to that. It'll be more um, sort of substantive um, around the world. It won't be a sort of political debate. It'll just be a revolving mm -hmm. actuality. Um, I could go on for the rest of this, but you know, as a result of that, you know, current energy companies um, like Shell, like Exxon, like Chevron, all the big sort of energy companies um, that are involved in oil or involved in natural gas um, will continue to expand their portfolios um, into more of a sort of carbon friendly type of environment. Um, and mm -hmm. whether that is through EV charging stage development, battery technology uh, development will be much, much um, more substantive in seven years than it is now. We're just at the beginning of figuring out how to store large amounts of, of cleaner energy. Um, and I think the, the the technology to do that is going to be on a massive tear over the next seven years. And we're gonna see the results of that. Um, in seven years, and then other forms of energy, uh, nuclear energy, I think is going to be much more prevalent around mm -hmm. the world in seven years um, than it is now. Uh, currently, in the United States, twenty percent of our power comes from nuclear. A lot of people don't know that either, but um, and and it's different percentages around the world. But I see that continuing, particularly because I don't see political turmoil going away. Um, you know, that all of these new forms of energy and the commodities that are required to to power. Uh, these new forms of energy are all going to be um, in increased demand. And, and I think that's going to be the, the most major change. And assets that go into energy revolution is going to be, I think, the biggest thing um, that transforms the world of, of sort of where paper and, and digital money is, um, you know, all the way out to the physical nature of hard assets and, and the power uh, that we need to basically move our world. Okay. I love that. Okay. So, um, I want to unpack this as systematically as I can. Um, starting with the first thing you said, uh, I think it was that the Fed will still be financing markets to some degree, right? Um, yeah. That's something that will be the same. How they do it will be different uh, through the use of some kind of digital currency, some kind of CBDC that they probably own and have centralized. Um, we also talked about sort of a revaluation of some sort within the precious metals industry, gold retaining some kind of uh, monetary value, uh, and then maybe more emphasis on its uh, industrial value, and then segue into silver and the rest of the metals that contribute to the energy um, in, in response to the continuing increase in demand for energy. Um, going back to the first point, the Fed. So then let's just spend one minute on this it doesn't have to be an elaborate response but what do you make of the you know the the hashtag and the fed um movements and these conversations that you know we would function much better in fact without some kind of a federal reserve um i can share my thoughts on this but I, i'm much more interested in yours what do you, what do you make of that sentiment and rhetoric well what we have seen is that the Fed has overstepped um, literally every every form of of its supposed day job, you know, to create price stability and you know, sort of try to maintain full employment. That the sort of thing that the Fed was was somewhat crafted to do, but you know, in reality, um, into 1913, the, the Fed was always crafted to uh, to be able to create create money for the banking system when there was a liquidity crisis. I mean, that that literally was the Fed's job. That is the job of the Fed today, and that is the job of central banks around the world, and in different measures, depending on the size of their economy, the size of their debt market, the size of their banking system, the problems they may have, and so forth. Um, so, you know, what the Fed is doing is really not um, necessarily just the Fed's job to print the abundance of money that it has done to really substantiate the entire financial system, starting from the financial crisis of 2008 um, through the sort of supercharged methods of 2020 um, to even more recently where the Fed just created $300 billion out of nothing to basically give to the banking system in the wake of the um, Silicon Valley Bank and sort of other bank turmoil that was going on because of that. The mm -hmm. Fed 
has the ability to just create money. Now that is kind of anti the idea of, of not only a, a free market system or the idea that the Fed's supposed to be there to stabilize, to just act as a sort of referee um, to the markets. That, that's not what it does. So, so I believe that the Fed in its current form is 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 should not exist in its current form because A, that that wasn't the point. B, the, the point wasn't even great to begin with, um, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of being there for the banking system, but but basically positioning as if it was there for the entire economy, um, which it still does. Um, and, and I and I think that it has distorted and the name of my book, Permanent Distortion, was no accident. Um, it, it's really distorted the relationship between money, the markets, the economy, and 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 real assets or structures or or infrastructure. And and I think it's been a negative on all of those levels. And the the, the wider negative is that there is such a belief that the Fed actually is helping, which makes it all. Mm-hmm. You know, the very much, much worse. And so you got the Fed and the Treasury Department working together, um, one buying the debt of the other through the banking system. And, you know, if you deleted all of that relationship, we would probably have a a better functioning financial system and and investment process um, throughout the real economy. Um, So... There is no real need for the Fed in that in, in that in that manner, um, but the Fed in its current form has, you know, created more problems um, that it pretends it's trying to solve after the fact than if it just weren't doing what it was doing uh, to begin with, and particularly since uh, you know the years heading into two thousand eight and 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 beyond. And and we would be higher functioning and higher performing because. Um, we would have reduced contagion, I suppose, in any sort form of crisis. That there's the more centralized systems you have, typically the more contagion you end up with. Right, banking systems, a classic example. If you know, if a restaurant fails, the restaurant industry becomes stronger because other entrepreneurs learn from that failure and they top grade accordingly. If a bank fails, the banking industry becomes weaker because of how interdependent they all are. Um, well, that's right, and and also the the fact is that the Fed which it doesn't do very well is supposed to be the main regulator of the banks and and I'm I'm all for having you know a traffic cop for the banks in terms of the risk that they take um the impact that can have when it goes wrong on the economy on individuals on depositors as we've seen but what what what's happening with the fed is that they're not doing the regulatory part of their job well at all and mm-hmm. so therefore they're overcompensating when when that creates its inevitable problems and and dumping money um to fix the problem and then you know and then tightening rates quickly when there's inflation etc cetera, etc cetera. They're, they're they're literally not doing their the job they should be doing to stabilize or keep stable the banking system they're just sort mm-hmm. of you know flushing money into it after the fact or when it's necessary and so if the fed were again doing its real job <laughs> as it's as it's positioned to do that would be one thing but 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 it isn't so yes um, it, it does create all those distortions along the way. So then let's just for, for a second um, get back to the origin of the Fed, which, as I understand, was in response to the Knickerbocker crisis of 1906. Right. Uh, there was a, a failure of confidence in the trusts, a run on banks, and there was no Federal Reserve at this time. Um, actually, the, you've got a book over your left shoulder, The House of Morgan. The crisis yeah. was largely resolved in J.P. Morgan's personal library, bankers and Right. Uh, trust officials gathered and uh, and he personally distributed a lot of the funds, largely his own. I think 20 million was sent from Roosevelt president at the time with a note attached that said, please save us, you know, and he said, please save us and give these to your friends. It was twenty five million dollars. <laughs> the first bank bailout but basically was a blank check to, to J.P. Morgan. That's and crazy. Just, you know. but yes. Right. Well, well, that that's what happened, and he did give it to his friends. He didn't give it to Knickerbocker or the banks that actually had you know real people, kind of like you know lowly people deposits in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually helped to solidify him and you know his sort of friend bankers, who who all sort of are are part of the large banks that we know today, whether it's Chase or or um, uh, or Goldman or, or or different sort of Morgan Stanley evolutions from from mm-hmm. that time. And I'm failing on the name of the steel company, but one of the maneuvers he was able to accomplish while everybody was focused on the failures of the trust was to create, you know, the monopoly in the steel industry in the United States through the acquisition of a company who was holding stock in a defunct rail company, I believe. Wish I remember. I think it was one of Carnegie's companies, but I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure. So we're we're back there, right? Wall Street's falling apart. The scale of Wall Street at that time 
unrecognizable. Let's be frank here. This is before World War One, World War Two, you know, before the Fed, and at a time when 25 million from the government made a big impact on saving Wall Street. So let's just put that in context. What what was the catalyst? What was the initial mission of the Fed at that point? Because that'll give me some perspective on when you say we're not doing the job they were hired for anymore. You know, so what was the initial mission and and uh, and motivation for the Federal Reserve at that point? Well, it, it, it came out of that. I mean, the the meeting that that happened at Jekyll Island, which was sort of where the, the the initial blueprint, not the act, but the blueprint that ultimately led to the act, which was the Federal Reserve Act of nineteen thirteen, happened. Um, and there was a a bunch of men who who at, who went there. I went to the Jekyll Island Club in, in uh, Thanksgiving 1910. I, I talk about this in, in my book, All the President's Bankers. Um, none of them were J.P. Morgan, but all of them got into the club um, on his sort of guest pass. You know, it was sort of one of these things where you could only actually even access um, the Jekyll Island Club at the time. Now there's sort of a, a row that connects into and everything, but even to get there by boat or by train and then sort of go there in a different way, you had to be sort of sponsored. Um, and, and the key person that was connected to all of them that was a member of the club was J.P. Morgan. So though he wasn't there, um, everyone else who was there had some connection to him. And that included uh, Nelson Aldrich, who was the head of the Senate Banking Committee at the time, um, and a number of other uh, gentlemen who were involved in what with National City Bank, which became Citigroup and sort of other banks at the time. Um, and they got together um, and they created a blueprint that, that, that created a central bank for banks. And the idea of that was that there would be some sort of being entity um, that could provide money in the event of a liquidity crisis or or a or a failure like what happened in in the panic in 1907 with with the Knickerbocker and then and sort of subsequent failings um, because J.P. Morgan didn't trust the government and the idea was that yeah I got 25 million dollars from the Treasury Department but gee that was a close call um, and so we need to have sort of a better mechanism where. Um, we're almost you don't have to go through the Treasury Department where it's a separate entity um, that can provide liquidity um, where and, and, and when it's necessary. But the story that was told to the American people over the three years that there was haggling within Congress about how this act would look into um, Woodrow Wilson's presidency, which is when it passed um, in 1913, was um, was that this, this central bank would provide money to the country so that if Wall Street failed, the idea was that there would be this central bank with 12 reserve banks around the country, and each of them would be able to provide liquidity to their member banks in their regions, you know, whether it was in Boston or Philly um, or St. Louis or, or wherever they were, um, to help farmers, to help industrialists, to basically help everyone else who was, who was involved in the real economy if Wall Street couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, that was a beautiful idea that that not, none of that actually happened. Um, but that was sort of the, the way in which the Federal Reserve Act was 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 created. The idea was price stability and liquidity, but for the result of of helping banks outside of the Wall Street Center. And of course, it was created by people at the Wall Street Center. So um, it was always sort of crafted on, on, on a shady kind of ground. Yes. OK. Of course it would be. I mean, you know, if you're in a position of massive power and influence, it's the ultimate test of character, right? You know, and uh, okay. So uh, second uh, point you mentioned and big change that you would anticipate by the 2030s is that the Fed still exists, but now it's operating with a central bank issued digital currency of some sort. What massive changes does that create in the banking system because you'd have to think that the entire monetary system could be reimagined on the back of a digital currency versus paper money with the digital ledger. So what are the what are the systemic changes that you'd imagine at that point? Well, it, uh, the digital currency itself, because of the, the technology um, behind it, you know, whether it's blockchain or some similar type of technology, has information attached to it that a single sort of digital dollar doesn't necessarily have. So, so uh, if, if you want a sort of piece. Of, of, of a digital currency, um, you know, just think of it, even though it's not like, like a computer chip almost that has all this sort of stuff inside it, and it can continue to amass information. And of course, it's, you know, it might take years to develop into whatever that final form of that is. But it's not simply money flow um, that you could see around a digital dollar or physical dollar, you know, where it comes from, where it goes. It's more like, what does it do? What information does it contain? What does it say about the buyer? What does it say about the seller? You know, what's going on in the 
market at the time? What's the currency differential to some other? I mean, it, it, it could have lots of different sort of aspects of information, maybe not on day one, maybe not even in seven years. But 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 the the idea is that um, it's it's like instead of trading digital dollars in, in the limit of what a CBDC can do, um, you're basically moving information and money at the same time. Um, and, and I think that's 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 one big difference just in terms of how we can think of it. Um, in terms of what that means to a central bank operating, um, in the event of these crises that happen, um, it's it's just that much quicker um, to, to again get get to a combination of information and money, you know, information gathering and money printing and moving um, at 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 no speed, you know, instantaneously. Um, so so from the standpoint of the Fed's book, for example, um, it doesn't change the fact that the Fed can quote print money in order to buy securities or bonds from the banking system um, through its discount window or different funding facilities or lending facilities it creates. Mm. Um, it can also now exchange information um, at the same time it's growing its book. If banks need liquidity, which they will, um, if the market needs liquidity, which it will, um, mm -hmm. you know, if there's crises, which there will be, and it's all the other things that it currently does, um, it can do just a bit more quickly, like more instantaneously even, but with um, information embedded um, in the printing of the money. So the exchange of information as well as the exchange of money for, for debt securities. Um, so it, it changes the nature of the relationship of what money actually uh, represents. And I don't know if that's all going to happen in seven years, but sure. but that's 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 the kind of path that a CBDC can 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 have. And that that I think is the main. I mean, is, is that not a major characteristic and and shift itself? Is that once the money itself is a technology that can be iterated year after year there's yeah it, it'll be something in seven years but it's almost an assured guarantee that it'll be something completely different in 14. Right? that's right yes okay. because information so 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 the, the money if we just even look back you know we're talking about seven years from now if you look back you know 15 years ago or two times seven ago right this was before the fed just you know created trillions and trillions of dollars and other central banks did around the world in the, in the financial crisis and then did it again double that amount um, in 2020 with the pandemic and sort of fed it along the way, um, you know, in and out, up, down in terms of some money printing, taking back, selling bonds, buying bonds, but sort of kept it sort of in that mode, uh, you know, this entire time. So if you, if you sort of expand that to seven years from now, yeah, you know, there's every reason to believe we'll see at least another crisis. There's every reason to believe the Fed's not going to get back to where it was at in 2008 or where it was at in 2019, early 2020, in terms mm -hmm. of what it has printed. And there's every reason to assume that after that crisis or a set of multiple crises in these seven years, its book will be bigger than it is today. Of course. I mean, so it's it's just there, there's it might not be, but 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 yeah, chances are it will be. What is your level of confidence on a scale from zero to 100% that we will all in the West be operating on a CBDC by the year 2030? I, I think all banks will, whether every individual account will be, will be uh, transferred into CBDC. I, I think that might be too short a span of time to undergo that entire transformation. I mean, cast your mind back to, or I wasn't, you know, when ATMs were created, you know, it, it took a while yeah. um, from ATMs to, you know, having apps online that don't even connect to a real bank. They're just sort of virtual banks. I mean, there's a lot of things that take time to, to, to be adopted um, and accepted by people. There's a lot of people that are unbanked. There's, there's a lot of money flow that, that is not going to um, transform even if a CBDC is, is the, main currency connecting the banking system to the Federal Reserve or other central banks. So I don't yeah. think it's going to be everyone, um, but I do think it's going to be every bank that is in the purview of the Fed. I am a member of the Fed. Yes. System. OK, that that's that sounds realistic to me. And I, I, you know, when you think through it, like it takes a long time. And, you know, the more you travel, the more you realize how many economies are still cash based right below. Yeah. Below hundred dollar transactions specifically, you know, 
Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and of course, there are ways to sort of get a, cr- a credit card right away for cash in, in, in various establishments. All that stuff is kind of still in development, use your phone, et cetera. But again, not everybody has access to technology. So, so that said, once things do get adopted at a certain level, then, then they do also accelerate. So mm-hmm. it, it's sort of like we could have a sort of just gradual growth, let's say, in four to five years into people transforming uh, or having to transform some of their accounts. And five or 10 years after that, we could see a, a big spurt over that period. I mean, it, it, it's just a, a question of, you know, also um, our, I, all people's access to technology. Um, and as you said, there's a lot of places in the world where um, where that access is just not available, you know? And so that's going to obviously keep um, the need for paper currency or, or coinage or, some form of exchange, whether that's based on gold or something else, um, in some kind of a background play. Can I ask you the same question in terms of the time horizon, you know, 2030, 2030s-ish, um, what core changes or thoughts you may have on the BRICS nations and how they're operating from a currency standpoint? You know, at this time, is there a currency competitive enough with enough market share that just gives a fair amount of the world optionality in terms of which currency they want to transact in? Is there enough competition that that's actually gained significant ground? And where does that bucket lie, do you think, you know, same time horizon? Yeah, so uh, the dollar still remains the the main currency. And in seven years from now, it's, it's still going to be um, the main currency. Um, there, there's certainly, you know, the BRICS currencies, the trade relationships with with China and Russia, with now China and Brazil, with with what happened when the BRICS created the New Development Bank, which was, you know, the sort of five main BRICS. It was the BRICS Bank and then became the New Development Bank. All of that was was the um, what happened in the wake of 2008. It took about seven years from 2008 to 2015 for the New Development Bank to actually sort of get together. Um, So so these things take time. And that was the idea of having more trade relationships, more economic relationships, and and ultimately more currency relationships. Um, Same thing with the petro ren versus, you know, the sort of dollar, petrodollar and stuff. All all of this is growing. um, And all of this is, again, in play. In seven years, the dollar is still going to be the main currency. Um, From the standpoint of, of emerging market nations, I think one reason why, and this goes back to gold, why we may see more um, of a stockpiling gold in some of the smaller emerging market banks, if if they can get their hands on it, is to basically have um, the ability of something um, on their reserves that is not the dollar that they can transform into whatever currency is growing um, at the time, whether that's something that's um, that's REN based, whether that's something that's more of a composite of emerging market currencies based. Um, but I think this is all a reason why the trade um, it's not even about gold. It's not even about gold per se. It's just gold is the thing um, that can be traded um, for money um, and for a currency, and and it's it's common um, throughout the world. So you know it has that sort of consistent basis. And gold is gold. Um, it you know it's valued differently in different currencies, but but it's it's a physical thing. And so that's why I think there's a lot of upside to the smaller central banks um, or smaller emerging market banks um, in that capacity. So. There continues to be movement towards something against the dollar. I mean, I wrote about this in many chapters in Collusion after uh, the 2008 um, period through 2015, everything that was in play. Um, These next seven years since then, there's been more of that in play. Um, In another seven years, um, I think uh, we will, again, see see more of those uh, relationships happen around around a different currency. But but it's not going to it's not going to become like some other currency that's dominant relative to the dollar because there's just other geopolitical and economic things in play you know like military like my like trade relationships around the world like allies switching back and forth you know so, so there's there's other things at play which would keep um the dollar at the top of that heap if maybe losing some of its you know yes. traction but still at the top in in seven years and you can 10. lose yes you can lose ground on the margin for a long time right i think it was exactly like- 30 year transition to um, right. shift away from the pound sterling, right? Yes, exactly. Long, long time, long time. Yeah. Uh, it's so seductive to fall into the trap of this is going to happen next year. Yeah. Um, you know, prepare yourself for imminent changes. What's your take, therefore, on mainstream media suddenly talking about this, a subject that's been ignored, 
maybe just because people don't care. I, I don't know. But suddenly, all of a sudden, and, and you know, you and I would find this comical. I'm sure you have, or CNN and Fox News are suddenly talking about de-dollarization. <laughs> I, 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 I cringe every time CNN talks about anything that has to do with currencies or the Fed or anything. Um, not because it's CNN, but just because, yeah, they're, they're, there's there's just such a dearth of information in, in a lot of those spots mm. that 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 then therefore passes as reality but 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 in this case i think it's i think it's attractive because there's a lot of geopolitics um at play at this particular moment in time and and, and that pops up all the time but but at this particular moment in time right we have russia you know still you know a year more into into its invasion of the ukraine we have all the sanctions you know with respect to what's going on with russia to europe with us to russia we have china basically um you know, sort of stamping its boot or potentially on Taiwan, you know, getting its some of its other allies like Australia into, into um, you know, sort of more tension than there have been before. So there's, there's just sort of more tension around the two polar um, sort of superpowers. Um, now, now there, there has been tension between, say, the U.S. and China, which are basically the, the sort of superpowers that were really sort of at play here with respect to currencies or de-dollarization. If you didn't have China... Um, we wouldn't actually be talking about this at all. China wasn't a superpower. If its currency wasn't inside the SDR, the, the special uh, drawing rights basket of the IMF, if it didn't flex its muscle in um, economically and financially from a currency and military perspective since 2008, which it has accelerated, uh, we wouldn't be having this because of conversation now, but I think that the, the, um, uh, the mainstream media wouldn't. But, but the fact that this has actually all already been in play and now there was a bunch of events that are happening simultaneously um, is something that draws draws their attention. In. And, and we are pivoting from the dollar. I mean, that that is a reality. But again, it's not like it's going to we're going to wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden all of us are going to, you know, have our bank accounts denominated in, 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 in Chinese round. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. OK. So what's your what's your take, therefore, on central banks rapidly increasing gold acquisitions over the last 18 months, but really over the last four years. And I, I could, again, I, I could share my assumptions or suspicions, but I'm much more interested in yours. What do you think? Well, because I think at, at the end of the day that we, we are, nations are on a path, particularly um, ones in the pole of emerging markets and, and that have stronger trade or military relationships or energy relationships with China back and forth is that um, gold is 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 that sort of common currency, if you will, that, that that can be translated into value across central banks and therefore across the banking systems through the central banks of different countries. Um, because all of these countries have central banks, all these central banks, um, emerging market countries are stockpiling more gold, some less than others. Again, there there is a there's a true upside potential um, to, to some of the smaller or even some of the bigger central banks like Brazil, which hasn't quite bought as much gold um, in sort of the same accelerated fashion as, say, China or, or at one point Russia had. They've, they've used a lot of their gold, but, but that, that that's part of the point. Um, you know, it's there as a non-dollar currency. Um, and, and so that's one of the reasons that um, weaker or smaller country central banks um, are stockpiling it. It's, it's, it's to kind of reserve to trade later um, and to sort of be ready um, for moving away from the dollar. And I think, again, that's going to continue. Okay. And do you have any thoughts on, so, you know, we, we tend to play that, we play the hand that we've been dealt, right? right. In that sense, it's not shocking that the U.S. is has weaponized the currency. They own the world reserve currency. That's the ace up their sleeve. In response, we've seen a country like Russia weaponize energy as best they can. That's the ace up their sleeve. Right. China is the world's largest gold producer, and they don't export any of it. Right. In addition, they've probably been buying tons. Right. Is that the ace up their sleeve? And could that be weaponized in some way? Well, if I believe if, if China had its brothers with respect to the way the current um, international monetary system is set up, um, not only would it have pushed and succeeded in getting the rent accepted into, into the SDR, the IMF's basket, because again, the IMF is a central, very sort of Euro-American centric um, lending and, and basically financial and central banking institution um, that has 
connections to sort of every country in the world from from an economic or lending or liquidity standpoint in some manner. Um, mm. China would have been also pushing for gold to be in that SDR as well. Um, mm. Why? Because it's just another thing that isn't the dollar. So one of the reasons, same reason that the emerging market countries have and will continue to, to try to get their hands on gold, and the same reason that China is not releasing their hands uh, from their gold, is that it is an independent source of exchange. And it has been for historical, you know, throughout, throughout basically since gold coins first started. Um, and, it, and it still maintains that value. It's the sort of one unifying non-paper, non-phys, non-digital, non-CBDC you know, form of, of monetary exchange that everyone can agree on. It was mm -hmm. something that backed currencies back in the day. It was something that backed our dollar back in the day. Um, and so there is this this idea, this this hope, this um, you know movement towards potentially getting back to that again. I'm not saying having a global gold standard, but it, but to having more presence of gold in um, as as a sort of currency or, or, or partial currency of exchange that kind of levels um, the playing field for the central banks that aren't you know sort of directly connected to the dollar um, in in, mm -hmm. in you know, sort of the central uh, currency basis. Yes. Okay. Okay. What what role would you, could you imagine, if any, that uh, an asset like Bitcoin plays in this um, evolution of the monetary system, which, whichever direction it goes? So, um, Bitcoin is interesting. I have a, a chapter in my book um, about Bitcoin and the evolution of 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 um, of that as an external currency is a sort of um, diversification away from the dollar, away from the, the centralized central banking system that is so distorted uh, the value of money. Um, and I also talk about it as a sort of um, kind of mutual potential friend to gold, but just in a completely different format, right? We, you know, we obviously you know, Bitcoin has mining characteristics and et cetera, et cetera, but it's technologically driven and it's also energy driven. Um, right. So the, 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 the cleaner and faster we get energy um, to, to move, the sort of easier it is to use some of the larger um, Bitcoin and, and other types of cryptos. Um, and I still believe um, and I, I said this in the book that if you're going to be in crypto um, as a use currency, as something of value, not as something to invest in, as something that could potentially be also an alternative to the dollar, um, that Bitcoin, in fact, is, is the place to go. So um, I'm not really a proponent of, of sort of investing in lots of other uh, cryptocurrencies, although they have use values. Obviously, they have a lot of volatility, so has Bitcoin. Um, but I think from that centralization of a decentralized currency, mm -hmm. um, from, from a use value perspective, that, that it still has um, a lot of upside if people uh you know are able to use it um in a less um in, in a more regulated manner and less volatile manner so there's more security with it and that's going to happen either again if it's it's better regulated and that again creates all sorts of issues we don't want a regulated decentralized currency but at the same time mm -hmm. businesses individuals want to know that what they paid today for their goods um doesn't change in value between you know overnight to tomorrow morning when they have to basically you know sort of bank the profits on selling those goods or whatever it might be um mm -hmm. there needs to be a, a sense of stability um in order for something like bitcoin to um to really get to its full potential um which i believe is as a an alternative to um sort of central bank created currency mm -hmm. um so i think again we're, we're still we're still looking at that scenario unfolding i think we're still we're still very early days in crypto as much as a lot of people have written it up written it down you know gotten into invest but the idea of using it exchanging it um to buy and sell things um i think we're, we're very much at, at, a, at an early stage of that and only um a smoothing out of volatility is going to um get that to, to sort of be more prevalent as as a use currency and wouldn't that be ironic how the success of Bitcoin might be measured by the reduction in volatility, uh, meaning it would perform more like gold and all of these ridiculous, let's compare the return on gold versus Bitcoin as their like central point of argument in almost every gold and Bitcoin debate, which is so ridiculous. You know, I, I'm aligned with you on this and, you know, 
I own a lot, a lot of physical gold and silver. That's like, yep. like hundred ounce silver shell behind me is some symbolic. Yeah. Um, why I own physical, but you know, I, I also own Bitcoin, and I'm I'm just as I, I don't know bullish is the term, but like I don't think even my generation's going to be the generation that determines what Bitcoin does and what Bitcoin mm-hmm. is. And a bet on Bitcoin is sort of just a bet on demographics, right? Uh, in that there's there's 16, 17 year olds that are going to come up and eventually be 30. And and their understanding of what money should be will be just vastly different from yours and mine. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's 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 a different framework. And so just betting on on that indoctrination at a super young age, coming of age, and then interacting with money um, is is sort of a bet on Bitcoin. That's how I look at it. Yeah. And it's, it's also bad on technology and not, not just because, um, you know, Bitcoin is the result of, of, of sort of math and programming. Um, but it's also data capture and it's also of cybersecurity and it's also of technological speed and it's also the energy to produce that speed. And so, um, there's a lot of things that are, 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 are at play that will also be transforming and developing, you know, as the years go on in tandem with, you sort of the, the coinage or sort of the, the, the currency aspect um, mm. of coin or cryptocurrency as well. And that's going to have its own impact um, yeah. as, as things get faster and, and, and easier and, and, and more secure. Every, all, as all of that continues to evolve, which it is, um, that's also going to be a test um, to an extent of, of how Bitcoin evolves as well as, as a potential you know, more broad use currency. So between between today and the time frame that we've discussed for the majority of this interview, 2030, shortly thereafter, um, some some major changes set to occur. What are the biggest risks that you think investors might be exposed to if they're not paying attention? And sort of in tandem with that, where are the safe haven asset classes or harbors that investors could seek out as massive transformations occur? People can be destroyed and also made very wealthy with the right position. But most importantly, where do you protect your purchasing power over the next seven years? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I think protecting your, your purchasing power, your investments, um, you know, two things. One, you know, the biggest mistake I think people can make is to be impatient um, mm-hmm. with investing in, in, in general. Um, you know, I like that you position this conversation as what happens in seven years, because the reality is um, you can trade. I mean, that that's trading, but if you're going to invest, um, then you do have to have a kind of longer, longer term view. And I, I believe that hard assets for different reasons um, from the energy um, evolution, revolution that is happening for multiple reasons across multiple components and you know, different aspects of energy from electrification to, um, you know, to sort of to solar, to wind, to, to nuclear, to everything else, um, to battery technology, that that's where I would be um, investing because because that's all part of of one big you know wave let's say of um, transforming things that basically come out of the earth or or move over the earth into um, what powers the earth or powers the people on on, on earth and and all the sort of machinery and technology and everything and transfer you know transportation everything that we use so so to me um, that's where I am invested um, in terms of precious metals from the standpoint of gold and silver, copper, um, lithium, and other types of battery technologies, battery storage technologies, because, you know, the the more we make, the more important it is to store whatever type of energy it is and and transforming those. Um, Uranium, because I think we're we're, we're definitely moving towards a more nuclear-powered world. And again, the safety mechanisms and technologies that are going to be in play for that as well um, Mm. are are places I would put money. Um, I mean, these are the things. It's it's real assets. I mean, this this is literally where I would be investing um, and putting my money, and also the technology that that allows us to produce, refine, manufacture um, those assets into things that we use, which will also be evolving um, over over those years as well. I think I think is important. Um, you know, the, 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 anything that's um, even technologically driving a, a physical. Um, manufacturing process, whether that's AI um, in, in terms of making things more efficient or mapping things better, or whether it's sort of virtual reality type of technology, or whether it's data 
preservation and cybersecurity technology. So, so everything that goes along with real assets from, from ground to use. Okay. Look, uh, I just want to say this, everybody who's watching, this is why you should start a podcast right, right here. <laughs> so you can, so you can talk to people like Dr. Nomi Prinz and ask whatever questions you want and just pick their brain for information. It's an absolute privilege. And thank you for coming back on the show again and making time. You know, um, you've dedicated so much of your life to shining a spotlight on the dark corners of money and finance and bringing them to the public. And I recommend everybody check out your whole collection of books. The first that I read was Collusion. If, if you want to start there, you'll get hooked. I guarantee it. But Permanent Distortion, All the President's Bankers, Other People's Money. I don't know how you find the time. It's incredibly inspiring. And thank you for doing it. Uh, you do very important work. Thank uh, you. And, and once again, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure. You you have the most amazing mind. And, and it's it's a pleasure to, to, to talk to you about all these Otherwise, we have complex issues that you, you, you help to untangle. Appreciate that. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you.